Well, good morning, uh, everybody. It is morning. No, it's good afternoon. It's 12.30. It's the afternoon. Doesn't time fly? My name is David Bazakli. I'm the Chief Information Officer of CTS. It's my pleasure to uh, host this uh, uh, important session today. Um, as uh, CIO of CTS, I have a number of responsibilities. Uh, I've been here just over a year, but perhaps more important, I think, for this session is perhaps my experience over the last 15 years as a CIO in law firms responsible for all things IT and for the pertinence of this discussion today, cybersecurity um, as well. So the title of today's session is uh, achieve frictionless cybersecurity within your uh, legal business. Uh, it's a serious uh, subject that we're, we're going to get into. Security is a significant focus for the legal sector, and it's a key building block in supporting the code of conduct under the SRA regulations, the bar, etc. Um, there is an increasing threat to all legal bodies uh, at the moment, and those threats come in many different shapes and sizes. From the long-term, almost project-driven approach of the criminal to the opportunistic hacker, uh, from simple email phishing attacks to well-planned, well-funded campaigns attacking your supply chain at its weakest point. And it's also very clear, very topically at the moment, very clear that barristers' chambers are being specifically targeted at present. And more specific within that, it's the barrister individual that is the target, seen by the criminals, perhaps the weakest point in defence. So a clear approach is required uh, to the defence of law firms and chambers, one in which technology, people and process play a part in defending your organisations, protecting your clients and your colleagues from this ever increasing threat. And we're going to get into that education and guidance are a critical part of this approach and that's why i'm very pleased to be joined today by uh, oz alashe hello oz hi david thanks so much for having me you, you're most welcome um i'm going to say some nice things about you now oz because i think it's important for our um, viewership today to sort of understand a little bit about you and sometimes it's easier for someone else to introduce someone than someone necessarily to say great things about themselves uh oz Alashi MBE, I doff my cap, sir, uh, is the CEO and founder of CybeSafe. Uh, CybeSafe is a leading provider of GCHQ accredited cyber security awareness training that focuses on better protecting people from cyber threats, both at work and at home. It uses a cloud-based platform grounded in psychology and behavioral science, which has been built to address the human aspect of cybersecurity. Oz is a former British Army and UK Special Forces Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, Oz has a successful track record of developing and leading the specialist application of intelligence, cyber and risk management uh, uh, capability to tackle sensitive challenges in business and government. He's got extensive experience and understanding in the areas of intelligence insight, complex human networks, and the human component of cybersecurity risk. He's also very passionate about helping to reduce societal threats uh, to stability and security by making the most of the opportunities presented by advancements in technology. He sits on the board of Torchlight Group, a global counter threat company, and is a keen advocate of social investment. He's worked with several mentorship schemes and charities that aim to help young people from all walks of life fulfill their potentials. And if you're wondering why he's an MBE, Oz was made an MBE for his personal leadership in the most complex of conflict environments. So once again, Oz, it's great to have uh, you with us. I've got some notices for people now sort of uh, listening in as we go through this session. We are recording the session. So uh, if your colleagues perhaps uh, have not been able to make it and can benefit from this, we will be publishing the video afterwards. We are very open and indeed, we really want your questions. We want this session to be as interactive as possible. So hopefully most people are familiar with Zoom. We don't need to use the chat function. We want you to use the Q&A function. 
uh, please uh, open the Q&A function and feel free to pose questions as we go. Oz and I, we've got some questions to get us going. We're going to get into this theme. We're going to explore it. But we really want to hear your thoughts, your concerns, your questions. And you don't need to wait till the end. In fact, very much. I would welcome as we get going in the topics, as things come to your mind, please pose the questions to me. I have the box here. I will try and bring them in as we go uh, and as they're relevant to the topic that we're talking about. So let's, Oz, let's, let's, uh, let's get going and uh, start, uh, start with this. Uh, we've talked about the human factor in cyber defense for quite a while now. What does this mean for organizations who are taking the threat seriously and actively taking defensive measures? What's that human factor all about? David, um, thanks uh, a lot again for the invite um, and the opportunity to have a conversation with a group of people, um, those of you listening and hopefully those of you who will share some questions and thoughts and ideas yourselves, but um, also the, the CTS community as well, who really do understand the, um, the way that this threat is evolving, not just societally, but as it specifically relates to the legal sector. You you read some stuff out at the beginning, David, that um, I'm sorry for the propaganda. You, you read the version written by my mother. So so clearly, um, clearly that's why it went on so long. But the, but the truth is that I have had the opportunity to look at this particular issue from a variety of different perspectives. Um, one of the perspectives that's most important is the human aspect but yet it's often the one that's overlooked. And your question really, which is, what does it look like to take the human aspect seriously? I guess if that's how I was to summarize it. Um, the truth of the matter is that, uh, yes, we have been talking about it for some while, um, but quite often when we think about it, maybe some of the listeners will be, and viewers will be thinking this way too. We think of training people. If we just train people, they will behave better. If we just help people understand and know more, in fact, if we impart everything that we know about cybersecurity into other people's minds, then they will be more secure and will be more secure as an organization. And it's just not like that. Most people, most of those individuals who either work at barristers' chambers, law firms, and the legal sector more broadly, they have really rather important jobs to do. And using technology is just the way in which they go about doing it. So, Taking the human aspect seriously is about being realistic about what it takes to reduce the specific risks and the important risks that you face. Now, you touched on the holy triumvirate, people, process, and technology. People, process, and technology. Thinking about people, process, and technology actually makes it nice and, dare I say it, simple when thinking about where we might be facing risks and where we might need to place effort. And as long as we are thinking in those three ways and then placing effort in those three ways, maybe we'll get into a bit more detail about practically what that looks like, and then we are absolutely on the right track. It's more than training people. If it was just about training people, then like I said, you just employ the best teachers in the world and only have intelligent people, but the legal sector is full of intelligent people and we all make mistakes. So the reality is how do we reduce those mistakes? And we must consider the human component when we think of information security and cyber security. How do people use devices? How do they actually get information from A to B? How do criminals actually trick people into doing things and providing information that they shouldn't do? And what might we be introducing by way of technology that actually might be placing a bit too much burden on people if we don't prepare them properly? All of those things are taking cyber, the human aspect of cyber seriously. How do we, I suppose, and I'm just thinking there, is it about a sense of ownership of the individual that part of the thing that we have to do is have people's awareness of some, their own cybersecurity and their own behavior that they have to take that on board they have to sort of take ownership of that and i'm, I'm just listening to what you're saying there Ros, about, about that about that human condition it's not about dumping information on them that's not ownership how do you how do we encourage people to take this area uh, you know it's always about something that happens to someone else isn't it how do how do we move people without them having to go through a cyber event themselves yeah. How do we move them to that point where they take that ownership? Yeah, it's, a, it's an absolutely spot on question because responsibility and helping people understand that they have a role to play rather than um, maybe consider themselves as bystanders or something that somebody else takes care of. I don't need to think about cybersecurity because I've got an IT team or indeed a security team or indeed we've got third party providers that we work with and they do all of that for us. And that's just not the way it works in 2021 with the way that we all engage with technology. So how do we do it? Well, the answer is um, we make it really clear that it's doable. Believe it or not, many of the things that we actually ask people to do don't 
feel doable. It's again, back to that point I've said before, which is just telling people what to do and helping them do it. One of the things that we do at CyberSafe, one of the reasons that, that we exist in our software platform goes beyond just training is because we literally give people help. We see a 67% increase in the number of people who go on to do really important things like change the default password on their Wi-Fi router at home because they got the nudge at the right time and they were shown how to do it. So helping people do it and seeing the benefit is one thing. Another thing actually is making it really clear that despite what you say, we don't want everybody to have to go through an incident to realize that it's relevant to them. But actually, most of us actually probably know somebody who has gone through an incident or we certainly know of stories or we've read about it. So helping people contextualize it in the context of their own lives, be that their personal lives as well as their personal lives. Having good password practice or password phrase practice is good for you personally and your family personally, as well as your organization and your chambers or your law firm or your clients, of course, who you are charged with ensuring that you look after their information and, of course, um, the confidentiality of their affairs. So making it really practical is one way you can significantly right. increase people taking on responsibility. Um, we've got a couple of questions already, which are quite relevant, so I'm going to bring them in straight away. But how do you encourage our, how do we encourage our staff to take advantage of the training we already have available? I think this goes to the very point of people have to choose to do something. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for whoever submitted that question. Sorry, I didn't get your name, and, and uh, so therefore don't know who, who it was. But if um, the reality is that, of course. Uh, there are a few ways you can get people to do the training that you have already available. Many places, because it's a, um, a regulatory requirement, mandate training, you will do the training. And if it's a regulatory requirement, then who am I to say that you should do otherwise? It's the right thing to do. Make sure your people do the training. And hopefully if you mandate the training, then you get people to go through it. But there will always be people who don't. The reality is, though, and here's the bit that I think is slightly different um, and maybe slightly uh, controversial given what I do. Um, why are you forcing people to do things that are not useful to them? Why are you forcing people to do things? If you are struggling to get people to conduct the training, it's because they don't understand that it is important and relevant to them personally, as well as their, your organization. That doesn't mean it's not worth doing. It doesn't mean that you've even got bad training. It means that there's a communication exercise to be done. There's a, um, a contextualization uh, 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 join up that needs to take place. Um, if it's good and people understand the importance of it and they get a taste of it, most people will go and complete. If it's not, they'll find a way to avoid it. And they'll only do it if you force them or penalize them, which in itself has some damaging. So um, without knowing what training you're providing, uh, uh, whoever's just asked that question, it's hard for me to give maybe some really quite clear practical um, advice, but I would suggest this, which is look for the bits within the training that are relevant and helpful for them themselves. And there's some really key points actually throughout the year as well that come up. October is Cyber Security Awareness Month, a great opportunity to spark. Ah. So there's a sort of uh, a national or international campaign on a particular day, which might be a good uh, a good opportunity to do. Just one example. One example. Uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm prompted to a memory in this conversation. Um, I, I, I was CIO of a law firm that uh, five or six years ago now had a, a major cyber in incident, a malware attack, incident, ransomware attack incident, which fortunately for us happened after we'd invested in some backup technology and also over Christmas, which allowed us some time to recover. And we did, uh, but it was an emotionally difficult time for everyone, including the IT teams and, and myself there, I said, who had to spend a couple of weeks, you know, recovering our solutions. And conversations with the leaders within that firm afterwards with regards to budget and further investment was easier. Um, the fee earners, there's 500 uh, people in the firms, a lot of them, very large firm. And uh, certainly Fiona's and others were very receptive to training at that point, knowing what we'd just gone through. And my message to everybody is, you know, how do you not go through an event in order to have to take seriously training? But the training was in person. This is just before lockdown and, uh, you know, it was a few years ago when we did this training, it was in person. And it, and it was compulsory, I must, I must say. But actually, what was really helpful is it was a very stimulating and illuminating hour and a half from a cyber professional who really talked as much about the personal threats in home life and how that relates to to work it was an eye-opener and actually what really helped was the peer review that went on so people who hadn't been on the sessions heard from their colleagues actually that's really good 
that's really interesting. You'll find out some interesting, revealing things. And that actually then really helped the, the buy-in and the take-up from across the firm. But I would just say that, we, you know, we don't want people to have to go through security incidents in order to take things seriously. But the nature, like you said, the nature of the training and how you do it and how stimulating it is, I think it is important to how it's relevant to individuals and how that message gets out so people want to attend. They feel as though they're going to get something of benefit from it. Um, so um, there's a, a second question here, which I'm going to, I'm, not, I'm going to answer, I'm going to get to all the questions, maybe in a different order, everybody. So please keep the questions uh, coming in. Um, the second question here is, you mentioned an example where threat actors specifically target barristers. Do you have any specific examples, can be anonymized, where this has actually happened and, and how it was uh, managed? And I, I also had a prepped question on a similar thing, so I'm gonna bring that in now with this, is that chambers have to deal with uh, remote barristers uh as, as as part of the course they're not always in chambers they're there infrequently their devices can often be personal devices rather than owned by the chamber or like a law firm where the the, the, the kit is provided so this creates in my view more opportunities for the threat actors to to target them and given the recent spate of attacks on chambers where, which have targeted individual um, um, barristers to get at their data. What should chambers be focused on to reduce the risks here? Yeah, it's um, those are both two questions, and I can see why you joined them up together actually, because they are really getting to um, the heart of the same thing, which is uh, why um, are my criminals target barristers specifically, or indeed, actually, uh, what is it about the way um, that many different aspects of the legal sector work that mean that the threat or the risk is higher from that particular sector or this particular sector. So I guess the, um, again, back to the, something we said right at the very beginning that actually really is undeniable. When you're, if you're a criminal and you're attacking a system, you're attacking a network, you are trying to get access to devices. And remember, criminals, they really only want money, information or access. And quite often they want the latter two in order to generate the first one. So um, if you think about that and just kind of simplified in that way, one of the most effective ways to do that is actually to go after people, to go after people. Now, some people um, are very good with their cybersecurity practices. Actually, regardless of job title, regardless of seniority, regardless of maybe even environment, the fact of the matter is that they... Um, take security well and their lapses and we all lapse at some stage might be less but for some of us actually depending on what we're doing changing environments changing circumstances on the move maybe with a fair bit going on pressure high pressure roles all of these things contribute to the way in which we make decisions and some of those decisions may necessarily not be the best things from a security perspective so criminals know this they target and they go after the individuals they think are least likely to pick up on um what they're trying to do social engineering absolutely relies on which is effectively deception so it's um not unsurprising and i clearly can't mention any uh, law firms by name um or indeed any barristers chambers by names but it's not unsurprising that amongst those people who have been duped and have been conned or convinced of something that is not right barristers would fall into that as well and often because of barristers are on the move because they're working from different locations at different times because they are sometimes carrying information that ultimately is confidential or indeed sensitive etc etc and they are really quite um, obvious targets but please don't take away from this the wrong thing which is to suggest that actually unless you're a barrister you don't need to worry that's not the point here the point here is that actually the legal sector as a whole back to the things that people are interested in money access and information ideally the more sensitive the better because it helps that you get the first thing really prime time well there is i think some evidence to suggest that some of the recent spate of attacks have been about the cases perhaps or the clients that the chambers are representing they've been targeted in order to perhaps coerce them not to, to take a case or to deal on something or just to remove their abilities or to try and remove their abilities to actually go ahead and do the work that they need to do. Awesome. So I think that is a little bit different perhaps than what's been going on. I'm very interested in the chambers who are attending this session. I can see a few of you from different chambers. I know if you have some specific examples or concerns you want to share, um, 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 please, please do on that um, at, at this point. Um, is it time 
for chambers to exert more authority over their barristers with regards to their working practices. And in other words, the independent barristers are a very independent group. Um, sometimes, you know, the, 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 they are litigators by nature, so they, they're, they're used to getting their own way. I'm not trying to be insulting. That's what, that's what makes them good barristers. Um, but it does mean sometimes that they've been maybe slow to adopt a standardized working practice, a recommended security posture, but maybe these examples and what's happening demonstrates how now it is time for them to, to accept that they have to, uh, you know, uh, do things differently and perhaps, you know, submit to new policies and sort of protocols and procedures. What's your, what's your thought on, what's your thought on that? It's a, uh, it's again, um, an interesting uh, question and maybe even an interesting thing to explore because I can see both the merits in the autonomy and of course, not just the autonomy, uh, but but actually the, the freedom that comes with not necessarily everybody doing the same thing in the same way, in, in a variety of different ways. And barristers will, of course, benefit from that, not let alone um, feel, feel, feel entitled to do so. But interestingly, when it comes to information security and cybersecurity, there is a, um, a resilience and a level of security that is enhanced by a collectivism that you just can't avoid and can't ignore. And as we become ever digitized, ever increasingly interdependent and interconnected as far as technology is concerned, then chambers do need to take a greater interest in the working practices of everybody who works with the chambers. And of course, that will include barristers. Um, there is a duty, of course, to protect the confidentiality of clients' affairs. And that duty is, sits with both the barrister, but also with the chambers who um, understandably from a commercial perspective, let alone from a, um, a, a code of conduct perspective, will have it, this interest at home. So you can't ignore it anymore. Now, you know, the relationship between uh, law firms and uh, solicitors, I've just seen a question come in, which I think is just what I'm about to ask now. Um, okay, uh, and actually it's just on the last one. So I'll just come in, it says here, as a barrister stroke solicitor, how do we ensure that business security doesn't impact our usage of personal uh, devices. And that is the age old question. Actually, even in law firms, I had this when we, the, the, the discussion we've had over many years is, is it bring your own device as a policy? And I have to say in the last law firm I worked for, I insisted that all business communications were through business devices. Why? Because the thought of managing people's personal devices and having to put tech on their devices to secure the business data, which you can do, by the way, but there's always that risk that in executing a, a command that says white device, it's been stolen, a few things happen. One, you wipe all the personal, you could wipe all the personal information off that device. And, and secondly, the next day they find it down the sofa. Uh, and they haven't, they haven't lost it, and you've not lost any business data, but they've lost a lot of personal data. And it always conjured up sort of issues for me where I thought, just fund the devices, the business themselves, but not every law firm or chambers in the position to be able to fund those themselves. So that there has to be, you know, the, there has to be policies for both, doesn't there, Oz? You need to, it, it, you know, it, it drive, ways to do, drive both. They do, they do have to be policies for both. And of course, this again is the reality of um, information security today at CyberSafe, we um, do allow people to use personal devices or some people and some people use um, business devices. And the reality is that we need to be able to deliver the highest level of information security assurance for both. So it can be done and it does require you to compromise or to accept that actually if people are going to use their own devices or we're going to ask them to, we are going to need people to put agents onto their devices so we can control what information is being used, control the transfer of information between applications, and of course, wipe the devices at our own choice. So um, in that regard, it's absolutely possible. But this is the heart of the issue um, when it comes to cybersecurity. It can absolutely be applied depending on the choices that you make. The thing that you have to do is make some choices. And in order to do that, you need to understand that I'm trying to protect my information. I'm trying to protect my devices and I'm trying to protect my networks and of course included in that my people. So what way do we want to work? And that's why I think, you know, CTS does a great job of being able to have that conversation and say, if you want to work like this, this is how we recommend you do it. And that's what we see being done. The best companies don't all do the same thing. They're just really clear about what's important to them and what risk they're willing to carry and what they need to do as a result of that. What, what we are witnessing at CTS, and this is because of some of the recent events that have happened, is 
And this comes from pressure from law firms to chambers, actually. So um, law firms who uh, also have to ensure that they can get their indemnity insurance, they have the responsibility over the client data, whereas perhaps in the past, they handed data over to their barristers chambers, not perhaps too concerned about the security profile of the barrister chamber. With these recent events, uh, more and more law firms are now stepping forwards and saying to chambers, you have to now demonstrate your cyber security profile. We want you to audit what you've got and share that audit with us. We need to be able to demonstrate to our, our mutual clients and, and the SRA and to our insurers that you are taking and investing in these things sort of seriously. So that there's, there's an extra set of pressures now on chambers, perhaps not just about their own security and having to deal with very difficult um, cybersecurity events. This is difficult enough in itself, but now all chambers are having this pressure from, from the law firms. And so I, you know, I, I'm just wondering, you know, I had a question here, more and more solicitors in some cases demanding chambers do these tests. What's your advice to chambers in, in you know, how they go about preparing, not just to do the audits, but maybe put programs together to improve their cyber security profile. What's, what's your thoughts on that, Oz? Well, you know, you're, you're absolutely right to, to point out that um, increasingly, I've talked about the interconnectedness of what's, uh, what's taking place. Supply chain attacks are a very real thing and issue. If you want to have access to um, a particular individual's information, you don't necessarily go after the individual, you go after people who have access to that information themselves. You go after the supply chain. And so unsurprisingly, law firms putting pressure on barristers' chambers is, is something we should absolutely expect to see even more than we're seeing it now, it's definitely seeing. And of course, client audits will continue to flow down and only increase, and we've already talked about the impact on, on insurance. So um, what can you do to prepare as a, uh, as a um, an organization of any size, actually, large or small, to make sure that you're in best possible spring? Now, the good news here is that what you do to prepare for a client audit is the same thing that you do to actually look after your information well, look after your staff well, make sure that you yourself aren't any more vulnerable than you need to be. And you don't have to make it up, you don't have to struggle with it because there's all sorts of support out there and actually some really quite good frameworks. Some citing some obvious ones here in the UK, the National Cyber Security Centre has not is not just the technical authority providing information, but has actually provided some clear guidelines on the NCSC website. And in it, they make it really clear how you can use the government's Cyber Essentials program, Cyber Essentials Plus, which is, I guess, a, a stage above mm. uh, with third party assistation, um, to ensure that you have taken information security to its appropriate levels, at, at least at a fundamental level at a very early stage. It's not the be all and end all, it's absolutely the fundamentals, but if I guarantee you, if you are adhering to Cyber Essentials Plus, majority of the audits you face, you'll pass. But actually you can go beyond that, NIST, the NIST guidelines, ISO 27001 is another framework. Information security professionals or third parties or individuals with your company will be able to take you through the steps. You don't have to work it out um, or fret about it, you can actually follow some really good guidelines to make sure you're reducing risk, you meet your audit requirements and you're compliant. And it's interesting actually just what you said there about uh, Cyber Essentials and the difference between, well, Cyber Essentials is not difficult to pass. I, I did at the last law firm, um, but Cyber Essentials Plus, there is a jump. And I think it's an important bit that you, you do Cyber Essentials to get your platform and then you, you must really, this might be, you should continue to get Cyber Essentials Plus because in order to, to get that, you need to have taken extra steps, extra steps, which are, are going to be important steps, not just passing audits from law firms and others, but like you said, it's a, a, it, it shows that you're addressing your security posture more seriously. And that can be a standard, I think, that's important for people to discuss with their, their chambers and their partners in their, their, in, their, in their firms. We've got two questions here I'm just going to pose from the audience to you so you can address them, and then we'll come back to some of the points that we have to make to sort of take this on. Um, first one, how are the risks faced by firms in the legal sector different from those in other industries? Also? Yeah, so um, there's, there's quite a debate. In fact, actually, the pandemic has sparked off quite a lot of the conversation around this, or certainly energised, re-energised some of the conversation about whether the threat is different, whether the threat is greater, whether the threat has changed. Lots of people are asking lots of questions. It's the same threat, but there's more people doing it. It's the same. It's a different threat. Actually, it's evolved. And of course, the truth is that they're all true to a degree. Um, and in many ways, that same unhelpful answer is the answer to this question about how and whether the threat is different as it relates to the legal sector compared to others. Because in some cases, it is different 
different. In some cases, the volume is simply greater. So it's the same threat. Organizations are facing the same risk, but just facing it in a different context and maybe at a different scale. So um, the legal sector, remember, money, information, access to systems. You don't just generate good amounts of money quite necessarily and quite well understandably for the for the for the uh, for society and of course for for the economy as well as uh, uh, individuals but you handle it and unsurprisingly the old adage why did you rob a bank said the judge because that's where the money was your honor um the fact of the matter is that crooks will go after where they think this this cash is that's number one actually sensitive information we've touched on it already whether that's your client's information um, and therefore an opportunity for them to extort clients or indeed manipulate or put pressure upon clients and um, whether that's the information that you have and therefore an opportunity for them to get ransomware placed to the heart of this we've encrypted your data you can't operate you'll go out of business either because you can't operate or because your reputation will be so tarnished that no people want to do business with you, therefore pay us some money. All of these things come into play and they affect all industries, but the legal sector is almost the perfect place to bring them all together really rather easily. If you add into that um, the makeup of the sector, as you described, some law firms really quite large, well invested, um, chambers sometimes smaller, less well resourced, people on the move, Hybrid working is not new for the legal sector. People have been working from different environments and different locations, and with that comes different risks. All of this adds to different contexts around the risk. However, the things that the law firms are facing, those aren't different. People are still trying to send your people phishing emails that they should be trying to do. People are still trying to manipulate social media information. People are still trying to get people to um, provide information over the telephone in order to maybe make their tax more effective. People are still reusing passwords, all of that good stuff, um, all bad stuff. And so um, in that sense, that's what we got right to say tonight. Um, um, a, a question just on this, and it's more of a maybe a statement, and I don't know I've got if we've we've got the answer to it, Oz, but I'll, I'll read it out. It says here, our chambers, as have others, have received numerous questionnaires from law firms. This point we've been talking about, where barristers are working independently outside, for example, outside of our hosted system. It makes it impossible for chambers to answer some of these questions because they may differ depending on the individual circumstances. In other words, a, a chamber might not have a one rule fits all, depending on the mix and makeup of their barristers and whether how attached they are to, to what they do. It would be good to know if others are simply mandating everyone to use the same systems or how they're dealing with it. So I think that's a question out to our other uh, attendees. There's 23 of you at the moment, which is great. And so uh, feel free to um, use the Q&A to pose some questions perhaps with how how you are dealing with that. And we'll use this as a bit of a, a, a sharing session. The other question I had here, is there a common threat actor type that targets firms in the legal sector? I think maybe you've answered that, Oz, you know, financially motivated espionage or counterparts in litigation. I think it's all of those. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we have seen very clear examples of all of those over the last, I mean, even just the last uh, 18 months, two years. And some of those are really quite high profile. Um, uh, you know, uh, cybersecurity incidents that have affected large high profile organizations like DLA Piper or indeed um, mm. um, others. But the reality is that uh, every single example that's been given there is a reality um, for um, law firms. Um, they're not always sophisticated, but often quite effective. In interestingly, and again, you know, I'll say at the last um, firm, uh, law firm I was at, uh, we were a large conveyancer. And so that the criminal would target the client, the consumer client, certainly around the conveyancing transaction. And uh, a lot of times we would be impersonated, the law firm would be impersonated. Uh, and even though we would send out notes at the beginning, we will never change our bank details. We will never interact with you in this way. Some of, you know, when you receive uh, an impersonated email with a, a template that looks like the law firm, people can be duped and, they, and of course the, the motivation was financial because it was like at the point of the financial transaction and convincing we're going to convince you to send the money into a different account and that was that was just cons that was just constant you know when you're a large convincing you're going to get that coming on it was very in fact it was never actually a breach of our systems but sometimes it's difficult to explain to the client your hotmail account your gmail account is has been hacked because of you and, and actually promoting that awareness with clients is tougher uh, because especially if you have, you know, thousands of clients uh, dealing with. So that was something 
and speed our, the, once again, the awareness of the Fianna to what it was, reporting it very quickly internally with IT. We could work with the banks, we could do things, we could prove things, but speed of response was important. And that came from the awareness of Fianna's and their support staff, very in tune to, to these things. The other thing, and I'll just suggest this, it's out there for the law firms who uh, are online with us today and, and those that perhaps uh, read this session later, is we tried to get off email as much as possible. Uh, we moved to online portals, our, secure, our own secure portals for interacting with two-factor authentication and other things with our client for the very sensitive things because email is open. It's not particularly secure. And so that was one of the directions of travel we, uh, we took on that. What's uh, uh, Oz, have you uh, have come across uh, similar strategies in other firms? I have come across similar strategies um, and firms doing a variety of things some taking a hybrid approach where only things that need to be on email on email, everything else is done internally within an uh, internal communication system, um, some of which are third party, some of which are proprietary to them. Um, and of course, that does uh, introduce some, 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 sometimes some additional work, but actually in many ways, some, some benefits. So really depending on the organization, depending on the capability or depending on the capacity in some cases, that will be absolutely right. But I do agree with what you said, which is, um, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is getting people to buy in and understand understand that this is important and this is now the way that they do their jobs it's not just good enough to be a fantastic clerk or a fantastic lawyer or a fantastic administrator or a fantastic finance professional fantastic finance professionals administrators clerks lawyers understand that they need to protect information and understand that there are criminals who would actually try to have, like to have access to it and as you say making a mistake is not the end of the world if you report it yeah actually being able to recognize that actually something's not right um, reporting it that that time can be the difference between losing a lot of money on reputational damage or otherwise and i think to do that you have to encourage the people who work for you not to be fearful of the report Absolutely. and that that really is a, it's a tricky once you've got it and people realize you're not going to crucify them for the mistake that actually what you really need to know is tell me everything that happened and tell me quickly. Tell me straight away and tell me everything. It allows us to respond. We were able to develop a culture in my last firm of very, very, that, that type of culture. And it, it, that message spread across the firm and therefore people began to self-report a lot more sort of directly when they realized it would, you know, not the sort of Damocles over the head, but having done it, they were actually acknowledged for acknowledging the issue and allowing us to deal with it. And that was more, and that's a, that's a cultural, issue it's not the the big hammer approach it's the work with us approach on this it, it, it exactly that and it, and it's security culture so often you will hear people refer to abc when it comes to cyber security awareness behavior and culture and it's worth considering all three of those because just because people are aware it doesn't mean that they actually care about it and just because people know about it doesn't mean they change their behavior or behave appropriately and actually your organizational culture will influence all of those things and the idea that used to be the case where people used to think that actually only if you don't know enough do you fall victim to a cyber incident only if you've done stuff that's wrong do you fall victim to a cyber incident um actually th those myths have been dispelled dispelled a long time ago but we're still dealing with a legacy tale. It's why we at CyberSafe don't use language like um, people being the weakest link, because the reality is that'll be like saying that the players in your football team are the weakest link. There are no other links in the team. They are the only links in the team. Without the team, those players, you have no team. So in many senses, in many ways, actually, it's really important to consider that holistic reality. Um, I shouldn't talk about football being an Arsenal fan right now. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty galling. But and, I, and by the way, I didn't mention Arsenal in my opening about you, even yeah, though I told you I would, but you've mentioned it now. So uh, poor, poor, poor boy. Um, there's a great question that's just come. I mean, they've all been great questions, but this one I think is very, very pertinent. Um, do you think the risk of insiders, uh, for example, those extorted by threat actors or who have their own financial motivations to leak data to interested parties? Is this particularly high across law firms and, uh, and chambers 
or is this threat actually not that likely to materialize? I have my own view on this, but Oz, why don't you go first on that? And then I'll... Well, I'm happy to share mine, although David, I suspect yours is, um, is if not more, um, more important given the, the time you've spent looking, I suspect, at just this risk within, within firms. But um, maybe just, just David, you've actually, the, the, the question brings together two things. It asks the question, well, there is there a risk of extortion and insider, and is it particularly um, high? And it almost says, or. And the reality is, I'm not sure that the or is appropriate. Um, insider threat is a very real risk for all organizations. Disgruntled employees, people making mistakes. So actually, I know it's a, it's a, it's a variation on it that's often not thought about, but people are literally just doing the wrong thing. There's people often are part of the organization. And if, are they a threat? No. But are they an insider? Absolutely. Um, but are they malicious? No. And so there are non-malicious and malicious insiders, but the reality is it's a reality for all organizations. It's worth considering. However, is the legal sector at greater risk than any other sectors on this basis? I don't know, is the truth. I've not seen any evidence to suggest that, but it wouldn't be a wild thing to consider, and I certainly wouldn't be surprised if anyone said that it was the case, given this the, the data that is available to so many people within the organisation. That's really all I'd say, David. Yeah, and, and I, you're right, you're right. You, you and I are very close on this, and I've had to deal with this sort of uh, personally from a security posture as well. We all, don't we, like to think that there's no one in our organization would uh, would do such a things, but there are drivers and motivations that sometimes you cannot see. There's the personal lives of individuals, which, which sometimes what you see on the surface is not what's going on behind the scenes. You don't know whether the threat actor has, uh, and, and one of the, actually, um, I remember one of the managers within my last firm her daughter, she was being targeted with threats about her daughter and pornographic material about her daughter. It was like, if you don't do X, Y, and Z for us, we will release images of your daughter, your you know, elder teenage daughter doing things, which of course I'm sure didn't exist because a number of people had had this very vicious uh, targeted attack in order to try and compel them to do things that they would never dream of doing, but using the most emotional, strong drivers. And they would, of course, as you know, Oz, how they do it, they reveal bits of real information to try and establish their authenticity exactly. uh, and their specificity to what is going on. Um, and thankfully, because of that culture we'd already engendered within our firm, it was reported straight in. It was like, we'll just delete it, we'll just block it, ignore it, don't. And it didn't go anywhere because you know, you probably know it's, it's computers uh, rambling and jumbling this information together and they're just, they are literally fishing for it. So there are different reasons why this happens, but it does happen. And there are, uh, we again, I think it's about the culture in your firm to get people to be open about this and, 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 and to, to, to share that information. I think that's really, really important. It is, and again, that awareness and promotion is by using, you know, sometimes technology, Sometimes, you know, our partner side safe here and what they can do with their training and their, their awareness of people become aware of what they can do and how they can respond and they don't feel powerless. They actually feel empowered to react. I think that's very, very important. One of our other partners, in fact, we just launched our new testing partnership, um, has technology that uses AI to actually detect the type of activity where people might be sending information out from inside. Uh, in order to sort of detect that unusual behavior. So there is technology, there is culture, there is process, there is learning, uh, and there is education. But to answer the question, it does. It does happen. We should take, we should take it very uh, seriously. Um, and so I've got another question here. So what should, I'm just gonna say I'm gonna answer this live. Thank you for all the questions, by the way. I mean, we've only got 15 minutes le left. I knew this session would go quite quickly. So what I'm going to say to all the attendees now, thank you for staying with us. In this last few minutes, if there's something specific you'd like to ask, uh, uh, Oz and myself, please please put that in, in a question now as we, we have a few questions to wrap up with. What should leaders of law firms worry about most? Loss of access to their systems, which results in not being able to argue cases, uh, leaking of sensitive client information, Spreading malware through e-discovery or all of the above things or other things. I'm terrified just reading that list. To <laughs> yeah. that Thank you very much. Uh, um, <laughs> is I'm, there a ranking order of these things, Oz? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure there is, David. I'm not sure there is. It is a good question, though. But, uh, but I, I tell you why I'm not sure there is a ranking order. The fact of the matter is that 
every organization will be slightly different or on a different um, stage of a, of a security maturity model or a security maturity journey. And depending on where you are as an organization, actually some things should probably concern you more than other things. Um, if you are an organization that uh, has done very little, literally you are just beginning your security journey up until this point, you've really only ever thought about IT, you hadn't considered information security and looking after network systems um, and data um, and devices, and you certainly hadn't considered the people component as something that you need to critically do, then actually you're probably quite open to quite a lot of it. But you might have actually been on this journey for quite some time, and actually you may have slowly been um, addressing risks that you face. Um, the thing that most organisations will do, those who are more mature, is they will think about the threats that they face. What is the likelihood? So, of course, risk is based on not just the actual um, uh, likelihood, but the impact as well, and then rank it in that particular order and address things in that way. All of the things listed by that particular question uh, provider um, could be extremely damaging and could keep you awake at night. Which one? And, and Oz, you've actually just you said it actually on maturity metrics, and that is something actually we we at CTS encourage our clients to do, which is no matter where you might be on that scale of maturity you should put a maturity matrix for your cyber defense together. You know, uh, listing what you do with devices, what you do with data, what you do with system security and recovery, what you do with individual training. List out these, these areas and then, you know, either mark yourselves or have others, you know, work with other, you know, um, agencies like yourself or ourselves to help you understand where you're at in that maturity matrix. Different firms will be at different positions, but that gives you your roadmap. It gives you your roadmap of where you're at and then what you want to do next and where to go next. Absolutely. So yeah, it can be very, very, a very simple matrix that you let you lay out, but you should do it. Um, yeah. And things like cyber sanctions and other things help you also understand where you might be on that matrix as well. And I, I really can reinforce this point. You don't need to try to work this out for yourselves. There are frameworks, Cyber Essentials, Cyber Essentials Plus, ISO 27001, then this framework that you can use that will help you. Actually, I believe there's even some guidance provided by the BSP as well. So in the last few minutes, I've got a few other points here. Again, feel free to, to bring questions to, to our attention, but let's talk a little bit about hybrid world um, because it's, um, it's the world we live in where now it's not all about home working, it's about mixed working. It's about summer at home, summer in the office um it's it, it's a, it's a brave new world and we don't quite know where the balance of hybrid will be is it going to be 80 percent back in the office 20 percent at home 50 50 maybe different for different industries and even within the same industries different mm -hmm. within different sort of firms so the genie's out of the bottle it's not going to go all the way back in but it might go back in some other way uh you know what's what if, if you were sort of talking about cyber security in the world of hybrid working what's your what's your thoughts on well I, I think you know for me actually i think what we're seeing now and, and what we've recognized over the last 18 months has actually been um uh, just a, a wider recognition of something that was happening anyway the way in which most people work and one way in which many people work has been changing for some time. And so you're right, some people are working from home and will continue to work from home or work from home in part. Some people will work from an office, but it won't necessarily always be their office or indeed their office in inverted commas might be a different location in a different place. And of course, transit between these locations, et cetera, et cetera. All of these breed into this kind of hybridity. And the reality is that the hybrid nature of what is happening um, is enabled by improving I mean, really rather excitingly improving technology and changing and evolving technology. So from a security perspective, actually, we now need to consider the idea that um, our environment is borderless. That's the way we talk about it in cyber business, borderless security. And actually, the title of this particular webinar, um, using the word frictionless, I think, very, very neatly links into this, this idea that actually we need security that's relevant and applicable and useful, regardless of the environments that we've just described. If you take that approach that says, how do we need to work? How might that change? What does this mean for real people doing real jobs? What does this mean for an organization who has these types of customers or these types of clients or this type of reputation as willing to spend this much money, et cetera, et cetera. Then you can piece together a plan that says, actually, this is what it means. And this is how I make it as frictionless and as borderless as possible. I'm excited by this. David, I am genuinely excited by it. I know that there are many security professionals who actually this significantly increases the workload, but most security professionals will stick their hands up and say, I am here to make my organization successful. This is about making the organization successful. And it's fantastic. And at CyberSafe, we laser focus on the human aspects. Our view is that why train people when you can help them as well? 
So don't just give them training, give them in our particular case, a mobile application that actually when they have a question, they get the answers they need from a the question or they get the nudges or the alerts or actually they get the reminders that they need at the right time. Or you can set the five things, the three things that are really important. I've mentioned one already that is just so often overlooked. Have you changed the default password on your Wi-Fi router? Maybe one for our listeners. Think about it at home. Have you changed the default password on your Wi-Fi router? And if you haven't, why not? And for some of you, it's because you didn't know. For some of you, you kind of knew, but you were told at the wrong time, et cetera, et cetera. That's the kind of thing that we see really easily making good, good practice. And again, prompted by what you just said there, uh, I talked about maturity matrix, but I've heard a number of law firms talk about beginning to profile now uh, different types of staff in terms of their working habits. So, you know, a profile of a member of staff who's very much in the office all the time, someone who's very home all the time, and a different profile perhaps for someone who's very mixed in and out, and trying to understand what the security plan might be around those different profiles is an approach perhaps to take. Yeah, exactly. Because people begin to think, how do I cope with all of this? Actually, break it down and profiling different types of behaviours of people uh, working in different fashions, profile how they do that, and then look at your security posture against that. And perhaps what you actually need is different flavors for different different flavors, different security solutions for different types of environments. And by breaking it down and focusing on it that way, that perhaps is an approach. Would you? Would you? I mean, I'm just making this up off the top. No, of David, I, I think it's a really good one. And and you know, we're careful about using language like profile because, of course, it has such strong connotations. Yes. Yes, yeah. but such yeah. strong connotations, but uh, personas are the way we think about it because yeah. actually, the reality is people are different or going through different things in different contexts. Sitting down to do that exercise would actually probably take somebody quite a long time, but you don't have to start from scratch. Again, if you're thinking about the human aspect, there are organizations like us who've done it already. CTS has actually thought through what is an organization who has most of their people who operate like this, where you need to look like and can look across other customers and other clients and see what they're doing and bring you best practice. So um, no one needs to suffer in silence. And I do believe that personas and thinking and actually going one stage further, personalization as well. That's yeah. all we're looking at. This. Would you, I mean, it's a, maybe it's a yes or no question, but do you think that this new world of very flexible work where people are working from home with their own kids a lot more, they're working more remotely, do you think it has increased the, the cyber risk, the threat profile? The short answer is yes. The short answer is yes. Um, but the reason um, I say yes so quickly is because, as I said, um, criminals are Cybercrime is a business model, um, and it's a business model that's pretty effective. They'll find ways in which to um, do their bad and or just, in some cases, rather rather um, inconvenient work. And so the hybrid nature of work and people using their own devices and moving about and doing it from different places and changes in, 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 in circumstance and environment, they present opportunities that can be exploited. So I do believe that the risk um, uh, uh, has increased and has evolved slightly as well, um, back to that point I made earlier on. That said, I don't believe we need to be concerned. I also think that there's an interesting time right now for society. We realise that we rely on technology, and actually even more so than we did maybe 18 months ago. We also realise that um, operating today and into the future will require us to actually be quite good at deploying technology, to be more innovative with our use of it, to adopt it faster, to get people up to speed. Bringing people up to speed in the way that they use different technologies, whether that's really actually quite fundamental or basic technologies or really rather exciting and uh, forward leaning and uh, maybe even more sophisticated technologies includes people being secure with it. And that's, I guess, maybe one of the key takeaways. Oz, as we wrap up, and if there's any questions from people just finally now, please, please just uh, post them up as we finish. I think it's uh, right and appropriate for me to just ask you was if you could in 30 60 seconds describe CybeSafe at its core because i think maybe the the attendees here you know might like to to see you uh, hear you articulate what CybeSafe is all about and what it might be able to do for you yeah so CybeSafe is a software solution um a mobile application um, or indeed a desktop application that helps people with the information that they need in order to complete their training and know what they need to do to be secure but also provides them the help and assistance they need at the time they need it. Wow. To give you an indication, we had a user who once said to us, thank you for telling me to change the default password on my Wi-Fi router during my awareness training. But it was pre the pandemic and he said, I'm at home, or I'm at work reading this and my Wi-Fi router is at home, how's this helpful? None of your people will leave where they are doing their training and go and take the action they need. 
But if you have a device that sends them an alert or an application or a nudge at the right time, you see an over 60% increase in the number of people who actually change their password, improve their social media settings, clear their desk, whatever that thing might be. That's exactly what CyberSafe does. So it's a- The app um, is proactive in that sense. It doesn't just rely on them opening the app. You're actually giving them like those friendly nudges, those, those highlights of things they might not be aware of. Definitely. Are you aware, you know, <laughs> you're connecting through an unsafe, device or something at the moment in some cases absolutely so do you know that you need to do these things yes or no compliance tick right now we'll help you make sure that you do actually do them which again is the difference and we make that really simple so that teams who organizations who don't have large security teams can do this really simply fantastic well um i'd like to thank all our attendees today and uh, remind you that this session uh, has been recorded so will be published on uh, I'm, I'm sure CyberSafe's and CTS's websites and other media that we put out through LinkedIn and things like that so people can link to it. And uh, Oz, thank you very much for your time uh, today and uh, for being so open to all the questions that have flown in from, from our panellists. And just to say to our attendees, if you want to reach out to uh, CTS and our plethora of um, solution partners as well as some of our own solutions, on cybersecurity or cybersafe, please do so directly. We very much welcome those conversations to help you on your next step. So you can reach out to me personally on email. I'll be very happy to respond to you. At that point, I'd like to say thank you all. We hope you've got something uh, beneficial from today's session. Thank you, Oz. And just say goodbye. David, thanks so much. It's been great seeing you. And thank you for everything. Thank you.